Okay, we're going to take a look at the game Age of Napoleon, and this came out by Phalanx Games in 2003, and was designed uh, by Renault Verlag. Now, I've had the game for um, quite a while now, but really haven't given it uh, a lot of attention. So we're going to take a look at the board, the pieces, a little bit of the rules, and I'll show you a little bit about how uh, this um, fascinating game plays. Now, right from the outset, I'm going to mention the superb quality of the uh, Phalanx Games components. They are really, truly amazing. For one thing, the boards are, are just well designed. They're fully mounted boards, and their die cutting seems to be superior to what we're doing here in North America. The boards lie absolutely flat. They're almost seamless. Real good quality. Color choices are very good. You can see here the major countries, green, Russia black Prussia, blue France, yellow Spain, and red England. And you have a lot of these minor countries also. Each of the major countries is identified with a flag in the center of the country. Uh, each turn represents one year, 1805, 1806, 1807, goes right to 1815, but each year consists, uh, consists of six phases. And uh, it is a CDG game, you get some very nice looking cards, which we'll take a look at uh, closer a little bit later. And it's a game designed very much in the Euro style. It's not a North American design game. It's got a Euro look to it and a Euro feel. And it's a little bit different than the um, GMT kind of series of uh, CDG games. Um, let's take a look at the counters. Uh, these are really, really nice. Okay, the counters in this game are very, very colorful. They're well um, mounted. They're nearly an inch across, and um, they're just high quality. And um, a lot of strategic Napoleonic games have um, kind of corps, divisions, and brigades as counters, and then you get a whole mess of leaders, which you put on top of stacks to create your armies and forces. Now the designer has not gone that way with this design and uh, it's kind of neat the way he's done it. What he's done is he's incorporated the army right into the leader itself. So being a game on Napoleon, let's take a look at one of the best counters in the game, Napoleon himself. Now he's got three figures there, 8, 4, 8. Now the first number represents his combat value. Napoleon is going to be one of the best in the game. So Napoleon's an 8 in combat as opposed to, let's say, Bagration, which is a 5. Green are the Russians. Now the second figure is the movement value of the unit. High is better than lower. Example, Napoleon's forces could move four areas in a turn. Barclay de Tolly, for example, could move only three. And the repercussions of these movement differences are going to be a factor in the game for retreat, for combat, and interception. The third figure, which is quite important, is actually the sonority value of the leader. Now in this case, Napoleon's innate, one of the highest. High is good in this game for sonority. And what it means is Napoleon could command seven other corps other than his own, so eight total. So for example, if Napoleon was on a stack like that, he could command all of these corps. He'd be moving this kind of a stack. And in the game, you put your senior leader on the top, so you know that he can move all the others. Let's take a look at some of the um, other forces. Now the white are uh, Austrians, and you get various generals. I'm not going to show all of the counters, but I'm going to show you all the nationalities. For example, Mach, a 224, Ferdinand a 234. You can see none of them are no match for Napoleon by himself. Let's take a look at the British. Well, of course, you've got your two famous leaders, Sir John Moore and the Duke of Wellington. Wellington's a six, and he does move four, and he's got a sonority of six. So even uh, in this game, they're saying that Wellington is inferior to Napoleon, commanding this size army. Now, we've got uh, the uh, Spanish troops. They're not all that good. Castano, Romana, and Cuesta. See combat values of two, and they don't move very fast either. And, of course, we've got the Prussians. There's just some example of Prussian units. Lostock, Tunzin, and Scharnhorst. So that gives you an idea of what the counters are like. 
Now, like many area and point-to-point -point movement games, combat occurs when two forces opposing each other are in the same spot. Now, the rules for movement aren't complex, but generally you can move as many areas as that middle figure. So, the Tolly, Barclay de Tolly, has three movement points. But it costs one movement point to bring a force to battle. So, let's say, for example, you had Barclay de Tolly here. He could go one, two, enter the square, and a third movement point to have combat. So, that's generally how movement works in the game. Terrain doesn't matter a lot for movement, except for places uh, like the Carpathian Mountains. Um, where uh, that's going to affect winter attrition. But we'll get to that later. Um, what else can we show you? Well, you've got control markers. And in this game, it's a little bit different. For example, um, if the coalition player controls an area, he'll have a control marker down there. The coalition always uses British flag markers. The French have two different kinds of control. That means French control as an ally. Example, if Holland here has this control marker on it, that means that Holland is an ally of France. Now, think of it as being, well, Holland is still an independent country, but she's on the side of France. Now, if an area becomes a French dominion, that's a little bit different. For example, if Italia here had this symbol on it, a little different than the other one. See, it's white as opposed to the bluish. It means it's the French Dominion, and that means that Italia is closely associated with the French Empire, and it, this changes the rules for diplomacy and trying to win her over for the coalition, that kind of thing. So there's a difference between a coalition and an ally, an ally which the rules explain in greater depth. Okay, in any card-driven game, it's, of course, the cards that drive the game. And Age of Napoleon is a little bit different than, than some of the other CDG um, uh, games, for example, by companies like GMT. So it doesn't work the same way as, let's say, uh, Wilderness War for the People, um, Hannibal, things like that. A little bit different. The main difference is that the cards have no numbers on them. Often with card-driven games you'll see you can play a card for the event or there'll be a number on the left which allows you to do operations, things like that. This has a similar mechanism but doesn't work quite the same way. The deck consists of only 55 cards. Now many of the CDG games have cards of, uh, let's say, 100 cards. and You're not doing as much reshuffling. In this game you're going to be doing a lot of reshuffling, depending on the phasing. And that's because with only 55 cards you want to prevent um, card counting and you want events being able to be repeated and each of the cards have multi-use. So we're going to go through the five basic different uh, types of cards, see what they do and uh, how they affect the game. The cards are color-coded, which um, is actually is absent from the rules, uh, which would have been kind of nice. I could have learned the game faster had I known that. But uh, you don't have to worry about the card itself because it states right on it what phase the card can be used in. So, for example, these um, grayish cards can be used in the surrender phase, and it says right on it, surrender. And, of course, you can play the card for the event in the surrender phase. Now, I might point out that all cards, no matter what they are, no matter what color, can be used to uh, do other things, like uh, rally forces, uh, move forces, um, rally spent forces. They have multi-use, and that's in the body of the rules, not stated on the card itself. So going back to the types of cards. Okay, the grayish cards are the surrender phase cards. The red cards makes sense, it says right on it, are battle cards and can be used to influence the outcome of a battle. The uh, yellowy cards are um, used in the insurrection phase and uh, are mainly used by the Allies to cause insurrections in um, French Dominions. And again it says right on the card, insurrection. Um, Green are reinforcement cards, which will influence your influ uh, reinforcements or perhaps hinder uh, the enemies. And you've got these uh, bluish cards, um, which can be used in the diplomacy phase. 
and the diplomacy phase is a very very important aspect of the game this is not just solely a military game it's very much a political game and um, some of the comments I've seen on Board Game Geek um, kind of criticize the game for that in that a single card like English Gold or Talleyrand um, can influence the game greatly um, I'm not necessarily against that I mean it is the Napoleonic period alliances and sides were shifting all the time so I think um, the designer has got uh, the flavor of the Napoleonic diplomacy fairly good even if each card does have a lot of weight to it now you have these um, other cards which are dual notice they have two colors green which means they can be used in the reinforcement phase and yellow which means they can be in the campaign phase and uh, I might have misspoke myself here yeah, the yellow is the campaign phase, which is the phase that most wargamers are familiar with. That's the one where you're going to be moving armies and fighting battles. So, there's a heck of a lot of cards in here, 55, as I mentioned, with all kinds of neat events. We'll just take a look at a, a few of them there. The Continental System, Napoleonica. Notice it says exchange this card for any one of the cards currently present in the discard pile. So that's a very important card. Napoleonic dynasty. Uh, you can convert up to five minor French allies into French dominions or in the surrender phase convert one major country that has just surrendered into a French dominion. So some of these cards are very very powerful. Others just uh, influence reinforcements. Uh, you've got interesting counter uh, art on there. That's a painting of the famous attempt to uh, assassinate um, Napoleon by exploding a bomb in a town square. So you've got neat um, graphics to uh, illustrate the cards. Those of you who are familiar with Napoleonic art will easily recognize some of the uh, artwork on it. Combined arms, depot, art of war, pursuit. So we won't go through them all. But that gives you an idea of um, the cards themselves. Let's take a look at the uh, play sequence. Now at first the um, play sequence sometimes feels a little convoluted, um, but that's not a criticism against the game, it's just the way the designer had to design his game to keep the events flowing. For example, in a card driven game I'm used to uh, a phase where the cards are handed out, you look at them, and uh, you play them as campaigns or ops. This game is a little different and it takes some getting used to. For example, the first phase is the diplomacy phase. Play cards to affect the diplomatic alignment of certain countries. And as I mentioned, the diplomacy cards are very, very important. They can really swing things. So for example, um, this card here, Napoleonic Dynasty, is a very important card. Players would play those cards. For example, a French player might play this Napoleonic Dynasty card to create an event that uh, helps him and then the coalition card might play this card to cancel that event and each player in that diplomacy phase can play as many cards as he wants to influence the diplomacy of the period. Now after that would be the insurrection phase. It says determine the outcome of existing insurrections and whether other countries become insurgent. Now the allied or the coalition player, if he had the proper card, could place an, insurre an insurrection marker in an area previously controlled by the French. So let's say the French um, were controlling Bayern here. The coalition player could play a insurrection card and cause an insurrection in that country, causing that country to be possibly unstable and eventually uh, go against France. So that's the insurrection phase. Alright, then we've got the strategy phase, which is a little, um, well, it takes some getting used to. Reshuffle the card deck if required, draw new cards, and most of the time it is required. So that deck that you've just shuffled and handed out eight cards to is going to be reshuffled again. That took a little getting used to. It's no big deal, but it does slow the tempo of the game down a bit. Then you have this reinforcement phase. Common sense stuff, deploy reinforcements. But you have to go to this chart here 
to look at the political alignment of the countries to see how many cores you can get. For example, in the mobilization phase, Austria could have six cores or armies on the map, but she could only deploy three new ones. Example, France could have ten cores on the map, but she could only deploy five new ones. So that's how this reinforcement chart works. So this chart, of course, is going to be influenced by the political situation on the ground. So the phases are very, very important in themselves. A lot of games, the reinforcement phase is kind of, you go, eh, just put the new guys on and away you go. But the reinforcement phase is very much part of the game because it's tied to the political. Each phase is quite important. After the reinforcement phase, um, you have uh, the campaign phase, which is the traditional one we're used to in war games. That's where you move and fight armies. You know, you move them on the map and you fight your battles. Nothing out of the ordinary there. We're quite used to that as war gamers. Then, after that, we have the surrender phase, just in case any country has been, uh, been forced to surrender because it's been overrun with enemy control markers or other events. And then we have the beloved winter attrition phase. If it is a winter turn, which is only on turns phases five and six of a year, then you check for winter attrition across the board. And this can be brutal, especially if you're in a mountain area or you're overstacked. And then as a final check, you have the victory check phase to determine um, whether either side is won. I should point out too that the, the size of your hand number of cards in your hand, determines on your um, political um, conquests on the board. Um, so for example, France would draw five cards, Britain would draw four, and it lists here all the, all the cards that the uh, countries draw, and if, for the French, they would get one card for every three minor countries that they control. Now, to a maximum of 10 cards. You can't have more than 10 cards in your hand. So, um, I'll just close off with the, um, the rules booklets and scenario booklets. It's the standard quality that we've come to uh, expect from uh, Phalanx. Um, the rules are how many pages here? We've got um, about 12 pages of rules and um, a shiny booklet with rules that are nicely illustrated. So it's not a difficult game to learn, but it's a little non-intuitive. You have to be very careful as you read the rules, and I think some of the concepts could have been fleshed out a little bit. But the, um, it's certainly you can play the game from the rules as written. There's a nice scenario booklet. Um, is it illustrated? No. Well, yeah, it is. Okay. Oh, and there's a card manifest. If you're not clear on a card, you can go back to the manifest and find out how it works. Now, um, I will say one thing about the cards. Some of them are very um, wordy, you might say. There's lots of text to read sometimes in these cards, and you have to be very careful how you read them. But if you get stuck, the card manifest will come to your rescue. So, that's pretty well it for um, Age of Napoleon. Um, I think it's a, a good game, and it kind of fills a gap in the um, lexicon of Napoleonic games right now, because we don't have a lot of strategic games on Napoleon that are only two-player. For example, GMT's The Napoleonic Wars is a fine CDG game on the Napoleonic Wars, but it's best played with multiplayer. This one is two-player, and I kind of like that. Game length... Um, I think you'd probably pay it in about two or three hours. So, um, uh, it's not a long game. Now, I haven't gotten into the mechanics of battle and how that works. You get these little battle uh, charts here where you fight the battle. Some of them go into the prisoner of war box. Some are permanently destroyed. Uh, the combat results table is over here, of course. Um, Depending on the size of the force, you inflict so many losses on the enemy. So I haven't got into the nuances of battle. I've tried to just give you an overview of the uh, game itself as a strategic game. So that's my uh, look at Age of Napoleon by Phalanx. I think it's a good game and um, a welcome addition to your uh, Napoleonic library. Thank you for watching.